So in our current situation, videos have become integral to teaching across all the disciplines. So our next speaker, Dr. Joanne Lovato, has researched how students learn vicariously while watching other students engage in dialogue to solve math problems. Dr. Lobato is a professor in the, in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at San Diego State University, and also a researcher at the Center for Research in Mathematics and Science Education. She's well known for developing the actor-oriented transfer perspective. Uh, in this perspective, the researcher looks for the ways in which students, also known as the actors, connect transfer and learning situations rather than predetermining what counts as transfer from the expert's perspective. Actor-oriented transfer helps detect generalizations of learning experiences and allows for prior experiences, including the social context, to affect transfer. Her recent research focuses on how students learn vicariously when watching dialogues. While her research is rooted in mathematics education, today's talk will be relatable for all since it draws upon vicarious learning studies from a variety of STEM disciplines. Her talk is titled Dialogic Online Videos in STEM Learning. So thank you, Dr. Lobato, for joining us. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Joe. You know, of, of all the areas I've researched in my career so far, this current project about new models of online videos has definitely been the most fun. So I'm, I'm grateful for and honored to have the chance to talk with you about it uh, today. So as Jim mentioned, the pandemic has forced us all to go to online instruction, which has resulted in K-12 teachers, parents, university faculty, and students of all ages turning to the internet searching for online videos. And over the past decade, there has been a proliferation of websites offering online videos for STEM learning. But despite the enormous volume of videos available online, Janet Bowers and colleagues summarize, at least in the, for math videos, that there is surprising uniformity in presentation. You know, either a talking head or a talking hand demonstrates a single step-by-step -step procedure for solving a given problem. You know, it seems like we have this amazing technology that allows students to access content from anywhere at any time and to control the pace of learning, but yet we have yet to fully realize its potential. And we need to imagine and create alternative models for STEM education videos. You know, in particular, we wondered, where are the student voices in these videos? You know, we thought surely there had to be any innovative videos out there that brought in student thinking. And because my research area has been at the secondary school math level, we searched for K-12 online math videos in a variety of places that we thought might have produced innovative alternative models like NSF projects and educational video repositories. But we found after reviewing hundreds of K-12 math videos, only a small number of videos had student voices. And we categorized those as falling into three different categories. First, you found some students who would just take on a traditional role, like they would mimic a teacher. And when there was a real dialogue and problem solving, the videos used animated characters instead of real kids. And for YouTube videos, there's an awful lot of kids wrapping formula, math formulas. Now you can find some online videos that feature conceptual understanding and show students communicating their math ideas. But these have been generally created for teachers, not filmed for students to actually learn from. So we found inspiration in emerging research uh, on the use of videos with dialogues uh, with undergraduates from several different science disciplines and computer literacy. And I want to just uh, highlight two of those studies. Uh, one was done in physics by Derek Muller. Some of you might know him as the creator of the awesome YouTube channel Veritasium. 
he in the study assigned undergraduates to one of two types of video treatments. One was a monologue and the other was a dialogue. In the monologue treatment, a, a correct explanation for gravitational force is offered. And in the dialogue, a student voices a misconception and then a tutor and the student have an exchange about why that idea won't work and then a correct scientific explanation is offered. And the participants in the study were given a short pre and post test using force concept inventory type questions. They were also interviewed and one of the interview questions was what did, what did you think of the video? So the students who had viewed the uh, monologue thought, thought it was great. It was clear, concise, easy to understand. But the students who viewed the dialogue actually found it kind of confusing. However, they're the only group that had pre-post gains, uh, unlike the monologue group. Uh, in biology, there's a study where again, undergraduates were assigned to monologue versus dialogue uh, treatments. In this case, the dialogue was unscripted, where in Derek Muller's case, he used scripted videos. And this was around the topic of molecular diffusion. And the dialogue group uh, outperformed those in the monologue group. And then Mick Chi and colleagues did a follow-up study to find out why that was the case. So they did a secondary analysis on this same data and found that in the dialogic video condition, undergraduates more often engaged in problem solving versus copying solutions. And they repeated and elaborated more statements made by the student than the tutor, even, even when the student made incorrect statements. So the authors concluded that the crucial element of a dialogic video is an authentic learner who displays confusion and asks questions. So our aim in creating our videos for our project was to feature pairs of students engaging in dialogue where dialogue is a conversation that involves the quality of inquiry, which aims at developing new insights and learning. And we extended this previous uh, research by uh, bringing these dialogic videos down into secondary math learning by using pairs of students as opposed to student tutor pairs. And by filming sequences of videos showing the same students learning over time. And by doing that, we hope to contribute to the expansion of different models of what's possible in online videos. Now, the rest of the talk is organized into two main sections, first development and then research and theory. So we call ourselves Project Math Talk and our videos can be found at mathtalk.org. In a previous exploratory grant, we created two uh, units of videos and in our, pre in our current NSF grant, we are developing six more units for different algebra one and two topics. And each video unit is broken down into about seven lessons and has about 40 short videos for each unit. So I'd like to introduce you to our videos by focusing on two features. First is the unscripted dialogue. And I'm gonna be showing you uh, two video clips from um, these two students, we call them the talent. We're, we're very Hollywood. Uh, Sasha and Keone were grade nine, 10 students. And they're working on a task in which they're trying to create a parabola from its geometric definition. And that definition is that a parabola is a set of points that are equal distance from a fixed point called the focus and a fixed line called the directrix. So to solve this task, you need to create a focus in a directrix and then find ways to place points so that they are the same distance to the focus as they are to the directrix. And I'm just superimposing the final correct solution that Sasha and Keone eventually came to. But they started out with a lot of false starts and confusion. Um, they had 
been taught about parabolas in their regular math class, but had never seen this definition or this task. They're, they started describing what they knew about parabolas as saying a parabola is a V or a U shape on a graph. And when they placed their first point, they used the midpoint between the focus and the directrix and were able to explain why it fit the definition that the distance was the same between their point and the focus as it was between their point and the directrix. And I'm going to show you a two minute clip where Keone places a new point. It's right under his finger. You can't see it in that little uh, snapshot there. It's right to the right below the, the correct point that they had placed. And they disagree about whether it's correct or not. It actually is not correct, uh, but Keone thinks it is, and Sasha disagrees with him. And either during viewing this two minute video, or I'll give you time afterwards, just enter into chat if you uh, are so inclined. And anything you notice about the video might be about the students, their interactions, the off screen teacher, the nature of their confusion, or anything else. All right, so here goes the video. I try. I mean, it looks equal. Okay, is it right there? Sure. Okay. But then it's like, then it's crooked again, and it's not, you know, you know? Okay, but hold up. Okay, so there's that, and then to there. No, oh, it's too short. It's too short. Mm. Oh, there's stretch. There we go. It's even. What do you think, Keone? Well, if both set of points are equal distance from, so this is equal, this distance here from one of our points to the directrix is the same as the distance from the point to the focus. And then this point the distance from the directrix to the point is equal to the <laughs> cheater <laughs> point for focus. He cheated, it wasn't actually. <laughs> so if they're both equal distance, do we have a parabola? Hmm? So if this is equal like that, and this is equal to that. Oh. How many points do you think are on the problem? Well, at least two. But then probably like, you know, like with the U one, it just continues. Yeah. So it's like, it should just keep going on. How many points are on the parabola? At least three. And Cause we have a, amount? Yeah, because we just have a vertex and then our two, and then we'll go, you know. If there is an infinite amount, then I think you have to try to find more than two. Until you get here. Wait, what? Let's try one of those. And then. Okay. Pick one of those and see if it fits the definition. Oh, well. Do you want to be perfect? Yes. Okay. It should be. Yeah, it should fit the definition. So pick one of those points. And so this point? That one you've already determined. Yeah, no, what are you talking about? Wait. Do you like that one? Okay, this yeah. point. And is that the same distance to your line as it is to the focus? Uh-uh. Just not. <laughs> Why do you say you guess not? Because, because it's like you can just visually yeah. clue and then... That's not the same. There you go. That doesn't work. I see that. <laughs> So I've noticed that a few people have entered some really uh, awesome observations about the video into chat. I would like to give another minute or two for people to enter and have a chance to read other people's observations. Anything you notice about the video?
A few things that I've noticed in the chat are how comfortable they feel with each other experimenting. Uh, they were friends outside of uh, this, and I think that really helped uh, with them listening to each other. Um, also, someone noted that um, the definition is sort of coming into focus. It's not in focus yet, especially for Keone. And I think this is the role of the teacher is not so much to give them a lot of information, but to help sort of redirecting their attention and guiding them. And you may have noticed that um, we have some annotations here, some labels on the videos. Our videos are not raw, we edit them, we annotate like we labels on, and we also summarize, um, we have animated summaries and I'm gonna show you one of them. So in this one minute video, I want you to watch for the voiced over summary at the end. And we do this to really highlight the talents ideas for the viewers, but we try to stay close to their ideas and we actually even use Keone's hand in the animation. And this uh, one minute clip comes soon after the video that you just watched. And now he seems to be paying more attention to the definition and correctly uses it to create a new method to place two more points on the parabola. And then we can put our points. Let's make it let's see, three inches away from that. Three inches away from that. Let's extend our directrix a little. So now both of our points. Is that three? Three. three yeah. So three. <laughs> <laughs> so now our two points. Okay, a point to the focus is three inches, and a point to the directrix is three inches. Same over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keone has discovered a new method. He first places the focus three inches from the directrix. Then he places a point three inches to one side of the focus and a point three inches to the other side of the focus. These two points work because each point is the same distance from the focus as it is from the directrix, namely three inches. And before we I talk about our research, I just want to mention what it's been like filming pre-pandemic and now. Um, before the pandemic, we had set up a film studio at our research center. And now we are just about ready to film. We have created a Zoom-based approach that uses the whiteboard explain everything. And we will be delivering these care packages of equipment to the talent who will be participating. And it includes an individual green screen, iPad, microphone, and webcam. Um, but in our um, prototypes, we've been able to get pretty close to the look of our original videos. So now I'd like to turn to research and theory about vicarious learning and share with you the results of three of our studies. But first I'd like to uh, define this term that I've been using, vicarious learning. So this was a term that uh, Bandura introduced in the 1960s, but we're following a more technology enhanced version of it by following uh, Mickey Chi and colleagues definition of vicarious learning, meaning learning by observing and engaging with video or audio tape presentations of other people engaged in learning. So you've just seen Sasha and Keone uh, engaged in dialogue and viewers of that dialogue are participating in their um, dialogue indirectly or vicariously. So the students in the videos are called the talent and the viewer engaged with their dialogue is called the vicarious learner. We have taken our videos out to high schools and actually used them with undergraduates. 
in a number of studies. We used students in focus testing to help develop the look for our videos. Um, and also uh, one study, we put one lesson in front of a larger number of students and then followed a smaller number of students as they worked through the entire Parabolas unit. Uh, I also had a um, student do his dissertation study with undergraduate math majors and we'll be sharing a little bit of his findings later. So the first research finding is about how the vicarious learners oriented towards the talent. Uh, but first, I want to share a, a, a theoretical idea from the Scottish Vicarious Learning Project, which was one of the original projects working in this space. And they conceived of a vicarious learner as a voyeur to dialogue and said that vicarious learning involves something they called epistemic detachment that there was an emotional and cognitive distancing from ideas and social demands. And that this could be useful because the vicarious learners are not as emotionally involved in defending their own position, then they might be able, better able to attend to what was being said and to be able to take on the perspective of each person involved in that dialogue. But in our study, we actually found some evidence to indicate that vicarious learning could, could proceed in just the opposite way, that there would be emotional investment instead of a epistemic detachment and that, uh, that the vicarious learners could orient towards the talent as if they were in a collaborative group with them, which we call quasi-collaboration rather than acting like voyeurs. And this comes from a, a study of investigating this pair of students over time as they work through an entire unit of videos. And we categorized five uh, categories of behavior that were consistent with what we call the quasi-collaborative and um, uh, of stance and emotional attachment to the talent. So let me just briefly share three categories of behavior with you. The first is that the vicarious learners frequently characterized Sasha and Keone's mathematical personalities. So they said, oh, Sasha, she's, she's like the generalizer. She always likes to find shortcuts. Keone, he's methodical. He takes the long way. He's careful and repetitive. And then they actually went on to align each of themselves with one of the mathematical personalities of the talent. So Belinda said, you know, it's like, I'm like Keone and you're Sasha, because I always want to go the long way. And then Desiree jumps in, yeah, because she, meaning Belinda, always wants to do something bigger and I want to do it the short way right away, just like, just like Sasha. Now, we can't say that they're in a collaborative group with the talent because the talents aren't even in the same room with them. But Bridget Barron argues that central to collaboration is a process in which students organize themselves to engage in coordinated activity. And by coordinated activity, she talked about paying attention to ideas of all group members, comparing one's work to others, and keeping track of what's been said. And that's exactly what happened. Um, they would, the vicarious learners would say things like, she made the same mistake as us, referring to Sasha. Or things like, she said the same thing as you or they have new edits too. And finally, a category of behavior was that the vicarious learners made several statements to suggest that they felt part of a community with the talent and believed that they were struggling together. A common theme was the pain of feeling alone in a math classroom when one is confused and that shared confusion via the video helps alleviate that pain. So I'm gonna share a one minute video from the vicarious learners. This occurred at the end of a research session. They just watched a video where Keone was quite confused and the researcher asked if they would prefer to have videos without confusion. They were adamant that they preferred the confused ones as they called it. And in this video, watch for one of the students to share how she feels like an alien in her math class when she's confused. 
If you had a choice, like a Sasha and a Kiani who had that confusion about where to put the focus and then they figured it out, versus let's say kids who just knew that it was one quarter and they knew how to place it, which would you rather watch? The confused one. Yeah. How come? Does because it make you more confused? No, it's because you're learning with them. Mm -hmm. And you don't mind that. You like that. Mm -hmm. It helps mm -hmm. because Sometimes you're, you feel like you're the only one. Yeah. And you're you learning like the alien. Yeah, you're classroom. learning step by step and they already you know. Like the alien in the classroom? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. There was one point in the class where I felt like he was doing like he was giving an example and I felt like I was the only alien there. Like there always there's always someone confused at some point. Yeah. And in the later session she reflects again on confusion and says you know, when I get really confused, I get isolated, like I'm the only one. But then knowing that she, I mean, Sasha's confused too, we're both confused. You know, so it seems it's like by seeing other kids being confused, you feel part of a community of learners. Now, I know that most of you do research at the undergraduate level. And so for me, this research uh, suggests other questions that could be researched at the undergraduate level, like would undergraduates value and find comfort in viewing videos of their peers' confusion? Um, I have a doctoral student right now, Mike Foster, who is designing a dissertation study. And as part of it, he's gonna be working with a college algebra students at our university. And one thing he's gonna be doing is comparing their orientation towards the talent um, in unscripted versus scripted dialogue logic videos. Um, the second research finding comes from uh, another dissertation that came out of the project by C. David Walters. Um, he worked with undergraduate math majors, and one finding had to do with decentering. So, decentering is a Piagetian notion that involves taking on a perspective other than your own, and in particular, understanding how your perspective, dif how someone else's perspective differs from your own. This is really important for the practice of argumentation in scientific and mathematical domains. Uh, Toysher et al. also comment on how it's important for teachers. Teachers who could decenter are able to distinguish their students' reasoning from their own, which makes them more likely to be able le to leverage students' thinking productively while teaching. So, uh, C. David Walters did a study with seven recent graduates, they were all math majors, just before they entered a secondary teaching credential program. And he ran a little mini course in the summer with them, 12 hours, where they used the math talk videos from this parabola unit regularly. And he investigated many things, but one thing is shifts in their, uh, the undergraduates' ability to decenter. And I just want to share a brief example. This came from a student that he called Marshall. It was in the post interview um, after the course had ended. And he was asked to use this definition of a parabola to find the, to derive the equation of a general parabola. Now they had not covered this task in the course. Um, it turns out that Sasha and Keone had solved this task, but this had not been shared with the uh, participants. And so Marshall initially um, uses his knowledge of a base equation along with translation. He comes up with a correct equation, but he doesn't end up referring to the definition. You know, the interviewer at one point says, could you point out where you use the definition of a parabola to help you find that? And he says, oh, I, I guess I didn't really use it directly, it just relied a lot on my prior knowledge. Uh, he tries a second solution method this time he starts by attending to the definition, labels of focus and directrix, uh, but then moves away from it, uh, uses a distance formula. And then when asked about geometric def information, has to do a bunch of algebraic calculations to uh, come up with that information instead of using it as sort of the grounding point to start from. But then, in a third attempt, the researcher asked Marshall, what, did, what does Marshall think Sasha and Keone could do? And again, he had not seen Sasha and Keone solve this problem, although we have tape of them doing it. And it's uncanny how when asked this, 
he was able to exactly predict um, the way they would do it. I'm just sort of highlighting here the, the similarities between Marshall's work and what Sasha and Kimmy actually did. So you don't need to read all that, just kind of seeing the similarities. And not only that, but he was able to explain, um, identify what Sasha and Kuni might understand and what they might have difficulty understanding, which we think provides some evidence of decentering. And I'm just gonna play a brief audio. And they could figure out that this is H also. Label this side of the triangle as a X minus H. We, I think they would have, as they look at that distance, they would have the Y minus K to get up to the vertex. And then they need to take away a little more. They need to take away P. So you have this whole thing Y. So if you take away K, you get all the way up to the focus. And if you add P back in, you get back down to the directrix. And that's what they wanted this from the point to the directrix. So when prompted to think about Sasha and Keone, Marshall seemed to be able to decenter by shifting his point of view. And we think that the regular use of these videos of the talent learning over time um, helps support that decentering. So, you know, this makes me think about questions for deeper research. You know, could dialogic videos be used to model important scientific and mathematical practices like scientific habits of mind? Persistence in problem solving, quantification, argumentation, proving, and could vicarious learners improve in those practices from engaging with such videos? I think there's a lot of unanswered and important questions to be pursued. And in the final uh, research finding that I want to share with you, um, we discovered a variety of ways that vicarious, vicarious learners approach dialogic videos. And this comes from the study in which we put a fairly large number of, of high school students uh, for a qualitative study in front of one lesson, the lesson on parabolas with Sasha and Keone that you've been watching. They all came from a pretty traditional algebra one class and um, they watched Sasha and Keone create the parabola from its definition. And then we had them solve the exact same task. And we use the same task because it's actually really complex and it's complex enough to be challenging for vicarious learners, even after watching the videos. And we found that all of them engaged with the videos and appropriated something, but their approaches differed and we called them games that the vicarious learners played. And we, liked, we identified four of them, which I'll convey in just a minute. And that those games had consequences for the problem solving behavior of the vicarious learners. So we used, uh, we adapted game, game the board theory, like board games in which players Behavior is goal directed and guided by a set of rules that regulate their activity in the game, their use of pieces in the game, and their actions towards other players. We inferred ways in which the vicarious learner's behavior appeared to be regulated by rules governing the activity of creating a parabola, what information they attended to in the videos, and the way they justified points being on their parabola or not to the researcher. And we inferred inferred four games. The first game we called the definition game. And fortunately, the majority of the vicarious learners played this game as did the talent. And by this, we mean that they attended to the definition of the parabola in the videos. They used that definition to create and justify points. The definition of a parabola really guided, governed their behavior. Um, but, you know, e even though the majority um, played the definition game, a number of other students played another game called the concept image game. And it was striking to us that even though the definition of a parabola was displayed or stated 41 times in the videos, some vicarious learners ignored it and instead relied only on their concept image of a parabola as a U-shaped curve on a coordinate grid. 
they attended to grid-like features of the talent's drawing. So instead of attending to the definition of a parabola, they attended to things like um, those parallel lines uh, that Sasha and Keone drew and different measurements that they took and then used those to create points that fit their concept image of an ever widening U curve, even when it resulted in points that were incorrect and didn't fit the, the definition. Uh, another game is the procedure game. These students seemed focused on identifying a set of steps to follow from the videos and it resulted in them often mimicking ancillary details like the length of the direct ricks or the distance between the parallel lines. And one uh, pair of vicarious learners seemed to interpret the goal as providing feedback to our research team on the design of our videos. They gave us advice about design elements like color and sound. And this was based on their own experiences of creating YouTube videos. Uh, but when pressed to solve the mathematical task, they then shifted to the concept image game. So I think this uh, research on games suggests some other questions for both our teaching and research. How should we frame videos that embody a different way of engaging with math or science than has marked students' previous experiences? And can we create or use online surrounds for alternative videos that could productively support their use by both framing the videos and guiding discussions of the videos and helping uh, vicarious learners attend to what is both you know, important to notice in, in these videos. So just a quick thanks to other members of my research team. And now I'd like to open it up with help from Joe of um, any questions you have, but also I'd love to hear comments um, about the work and also connections to your own work. Great, thank you so much, uh, Joanne. Um, this was fantastic. And uh, so we have a, a number of questions and I wanted to start off with um, the, the few questions that were kind of more about the, um, stru the structure. So more like the, um, uh, maybe the softball questions, which is like, what's the length of, the, there's like three here that kind of fit into this. Like what's the length of the videos? Um, did the learners watch it in pairs also? And is there a value there? And did you write the scripts? So all of our videos are unscripted. So the dialogue is just natural between the kids. But what we do afterwards is we, um, you know, edit the videos. And I guess that's a kind of script is that we're putting together a storyline afterwards. Um, so in our videos, if you go to our website, you'll see that each lesson is broken into four to seven short videos. And each video is called an episode and it's between two and 10 minutes long. Um, and we actually use different video types for those episodes because our emphasis is really on problem solving, not on procedural knowledge. Um, we have a making sense type video that starts a lesson where the talent are just comprehending the problem situation. And then they have an exploring episode where they're actually solving the problem. Then there's a reflecting video where they look back on what they've done and explain it again, make connections. And then there's a repeating your reasoning, which uses a paired task. It tells the vicarious learners to stop the video and try the problem on their own and then resume the video. So it's sort of like practice within a conceptually you know, problem solving oriented video. Um, we did all our studies um, using pairs as the vicarious learners because of research by Mickey Chi and colleagues that had demonstrated that it was much more effective to use pairs rather than singletons. We also just for research sake, since this was such exploratory work, wanted to get a good trace of what they were saying as they were interacting with the videos. And Joe, is it better if I stop share at this point or? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, another question that was earlier on, um, but I think is really still pertinent here, which is, does the inclusion of faces hamper the cognitive processes? So meaning like if you were just to show the hands or the, and still hear the dialogue, like how does the inclusion or exclusion of faces affect um, how the vicarious learning 
can take place? Wow, that's a really, that's a good question. Um, so I have two thoughts. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. My thought, my guess from the work we did on the orientation of vicarious learners towards the talent, and again, this was very exploratory, was that the faces mattered, that they, you know, the kids wanted to be able to connect with and did connect with the talent as peers. Um, you know, I, I sense that the question has to do with cognitive overload. And Derek Muller has an interesting paper where he um, tackles head on some research that's been done on um, cognitive overload with the production of videos. And he says that for dialogic videos, it's actually, there might be some cognitive overload, but on the other hand, the, in, the importance of getting misconceptions displayed in the dialogue is more important. And he showed how that was, I can't remember the exact study right now, but I think that, that there's important things about having the ideas related to the individuals um, in the dialogue, but I think it's an open question for investigation. Yeah. Um, there was a question about why, um, and I think you might have hit on this a little bit there at the end, but why learn about parabolas? Like what, what is this, <laughs> what's motivating? Like, um, you know, is there anything in the, in the way it's presented that is motivating for the students in order to learn about the parabolas or is it to learn how to apply the definition of a parabola and, and work through it? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, in the original grant, it was just a small exploratory DRK-12 grant. I wanted to pick some things. We did one unit on proportional reasoning, one unit on parabolas. I wanted to do something that I'd had some experience uh, working with either high school kids or undergraduates on. And the reason I think the parabola topic was important, I mean, it is something that kids are required to uh, cover in high school, especially the vertex form of a parabola, but it's generally done much faster. The reason I wanted to sort of open it up and unpack it is there's a lot of opportunity for um, quantitative reasoning. And by quantitative reasoning, I'm really following Pat Thompson here and talking about um, attributes that are measurable in a situation. So what I, found, what I find when I work with math majors uh, in a course I teach where I show these videos and have them solve problems is their initial uh, a way of approaching similar problems is not to think about the, it seems crazy, but to not think about points and different things in the coordinate plane in terms of distances. So that's the quantity that seems really important that gets highlighted in Sasha and Keone's work. And I think that can be very powerful uh, for students at, at both the undergraduate and the high school level. Yeah, great. Um, so I, I, uh, there's a kind of a series of uh, comments here um, that I'm going to try to synthesize, but um, was about uh, the interaction with Marshall. And uh -huh. so his uh, viewing or yeah, his watching the videos, but also his, his work there. And so I'm wondering, um, so the question was about uh, when he was asked, what, when asked what the students in the video would do is um, he kind of has a very different method, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so they were wondering if Marshall believed he knew more or knew less. And if that's what prompted the shift in problem solving, like trying to be comparative to these others that are in the video, if that's what's actually driving the kind of shift in the problem solving that went on. So this research came from C. David Walters, who was uh, my doctoral student at the time. And I don't remember all of the details, but I do remember that Marshall actually, looking back on his different solutions, actually ended up valuing the more quantitative reasoning approach that had more explicit attention to geometric features and distances in the coordinate plane of Sasha and Keone. Great. Um, and the last uh, question really is about um, the decentering and whether, like, um, if, if you've thought much about um, whether that's a teachable skill, like, is that something that instructors, how do you, how do you get students to do that decentering a little more effectively? Yeah, so, you know, 
we've been in, in math ed uh, for teacher preparation, and we've been sharing vignettes and videos of kids thinking for you know two decades now. But one thing I think that's really special about videos where you can track the same pair of students over time. Uh, and by the way, I've been using the Parabola unit in a math course that I teach at San Diego State for prospective secondary high school teachers. So they're right at the end of their math major. And I notice that they are able to um, decenter in part because they come to know those kids. It's not just quick vignettes or quick excerpts, but they actually start to become able to think like the kids. Um, and we're actually using um, some of these materials at CSU Channel Islands right now. Also, Brooke Ernest is using them with her math majors. And I think that this trajectory of the, the students being able to have sustained experience with the same students over time helps with that decentering, that they come to actually value and be able to predict um, this, what the students will do and come to see them as really capable problem solvers. And I think that that longer exposure has a special affordance that, that I'd like to do more research on. Great. Well, uh, so that's the end of the time that we have. And so um, thank you very much, Dr. Lovato, for that um, wonderful presentation. We really appreciate that. And hopefully you're able to um, still be at the conference for the rest of the <laughs> people can track you down if they have additional questions or email you.